Hi everyone, I'm Robin. I'm your chairperson for the day. I'm not really going to talk very much. So we've got this wonderful speaker, Matthew. He's come all the way from Durban. He's going to speak to us about basically open data and civic engineering and how he's making sure we don't get fake news, which is absolutely great. So thanks so much for being here, Matthew, thanks. and good luck. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's quite nervous being in the very big room. Um, I was expecting to be kind of shuffled off to a corner. Um, but yeah, it's really great to come and chat to you guys about um, some of the project work that I do um, with Open Data Durban, which is a non-profit in the civic technology space. Um, we're quite young. We've been in operation for just over a year and a half. Um, I'm actually a biological engineer by training, and so kind of have came into the world of Python and programming just out of necessity, um, shamelessly hacking together code that I needed to finish a PhD, but then absolutely fell in love with data, really enjoyed the language. Um, and now I find myself working in civic technology. So I, you will have to forgive me, this is not going to be a talk of glorious programming and beautiful database models. It's going to focus a lot more on the accountability side and how we can use code and we can use um, data science in order to drive a better and more inclusive society. Um, I also am quite happy to be interrupted. I'd rather discuss than talk to. Um, so if you have questions and it's pertinent, please just chat it out. I'd rather discuss than, than present. Um, so just to give a bit of a, sorry, let's see if this is working now. Um, hang on. Why is this not changing now? Nope, I can do it from here, I guess. Okay, there we go. I'll just talk from this for some reason. Oh, there we go, now it's changing. Um, okay, so just to give you a little bit of a backstory about Open Data Durban, it's a non profit civic technology lab that implements and advocates for open data, open government, and civic technology through projects, events, workshops and data quests, which are basically hackathons that don't require just techies. It's trying to find a synergy between people in society that are both storytellers, um, journalists, um, graphic designers, data scientists, anything to get a powerful message across rather than just a tech solution. Um, and we work with governments, citizens, civic society, the media, and we attempt to democratize knowledge and enable informed decision-making and evidence-based planning. Now, that's, that's a lot of words. Um, let's try and break that down a little bit. So we're very much city-focused. We, um, we're the first city-focused data lab in, in Africa. We're not the first civic tech organization by a long shot, but we have found our niche working at the city level. And this is because we believe that local gives the important levels of granularity that allow you to deal with complex issues. I think a lot of time data is viewed from a top-down perspective. You start big and then you have to try and scramble for data later rather than do the hard job of gathering fine-grained data and then building yourself up. So this is our perspective. We're not saying that regional studies and national studies are in any way less important. It's just this is, these are the, this is the level where we try and find the information to ta tackle the challenges that we want to. Um, and we also believe that if you start getting data at the person level, you're going to better help close the um, gaps in missing data and information. And we just find that that's just a good place to start. Um, and which allows for evidence-based planning and, of course, social development. And the main goal is trying to remove tech as a discriminating agent, which it invariably is. In fact, the more technology goes, the larger the gap widens between those who have access to information data and the power that that grants them to those who don't. And so we're hoping that by engaging correctly at the ground level and with at the people level, we can help ensure that that gap isn't an issue. We can close the gap and we can make it a, an equalizer rather than a divider. And finally, user-centered design is absolutely paramount. Um, we would rather give somebody a piece of paper with a bit of important information on it than a flashy app. The goal is to try and have impact. It's an extension of the, the keynote this morning. Uh, being a millennial, I don't want to do anything that doesn't have impact, but it's the impact that's needed, not the impact that I want to have. And so we try to design with a person in, in mind and a person as a focus, rather than just saying, great, databases are cool, let's do a database. Um, databases are cool but we try and find applications for them that really work. 
So this is just an interesting little plot, which kind of gives our, our view, um, kind of a view of accountability from less to more, technology from less to more. Um, and in many cases, you'll see a couple of things. Business generally has a lot of technology, but it also often sits in a space where there's less monitoring, there's less accountability for profits, op operators for profits. There's nothing wrong with that, but they do their own thing. Um, and a lot of time, open data has kind of sat in the space where, at least in the first few waves of open data, it was just get data out there, rather than what is the data saying, what is the story being told, what is the point of this data. And then you get certain things like private citizens, particularly in South Africa, you'll sit lower in the technology space, government. Um, and as you move forward, you th get things that are a bit more accountable, things like the media, things like civil society. But we want to see, can we exist in the space that's up here? Is more technology, using technology, and driving accountability with it. So just to give you a little sense of some of the stuff we do, um, all of it cobbled together with Python as often as possible. This is a little um, application we're developing called uh, Durban Answers. It's built off a Code for America project called Honolulu Answers, where if any of you have ever navigate, tried to navigate a government website in this country, it's often you're facing one hell, one hell of a journey. Um, they're unwieldy, there's no guides, there's seldom a sitemap. And we're trying to take the approach of, can we make a system where people just ask questions and they get answers. You type in license and it brings up a list of questions. How do I get a new driver's license? What does it cost? And what date <laughs> is associated with that cost? Um, what happens if I buy a car from somebody that's overseas and can't exchange the correct paperwork, which is something I had to try and fight through with five trips to the traffic department. I want to be able to save people that pain. So that's an example of something we're trying to make data a little bit more closer and easier to access. Um, we do an active citizens project where we're trying to bring, um, allow school children to be able to lobby for themselves. We're working on starting a weather sensor project where we're trying to get students to collect and analyze micro weather data from sensors that they've learned to put together and then lobby for their own air quality and start to ask questions about their environment. Why? Um, what do different areas look like? Why should ours be any different? Kind of put the the opportunity for choice and advocacy in their hands. Um, we work a little bit with the, metro with the metros, not directly, but through organizations that support them. So the South African Cities Network, we're trying to help government work with its data better, have better communication across departments, visualize data rather than looking at absolutely atrocious um, Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> move it into a space of sharing and discussion and openness rather than lockdown, lockdown data sets. Um, we also like to partner with um, other non-profit organization, uh, organizations, so Isantla Institute, we built a little monitoring system for them to monitor how much government is keeping in line with um, the, the milestones that they've set. It's kind of an accountability platform to keep a log of different cities and how they're performing. Um, this was a project we did with City Press um, to help provide a, a line of information and assistance during the initiation seasons in the Eastern Cape both to kind of drive um, traditional healers to get um, officially trained and assist with that side, as well as providing support to families and initiates. Um, so we found that was quite a fun project, working with the media. Um, a couple of challenges in the community to drive data-driven storytelling and responsive cities, smart cities. And now what I'm going to spend the rest of my talk discussing is MMA Dexter, which is a platform that is used to ingest automatically all the sources of digital media, well, as much as we can, um, every day, and build up a database and an analysis platform to be able to look at, engage with, check for agenda, check for representation, and interrogate the news media across this country um, with a view of helping to provide um, advocacy and assist with uh, the watchdog process and keep the, the media in this country free and fair. Um, and it's one of, the th one of the most powerful things I think about South Africa is it's, it's staunchly free and, and powerful press. Um, so what does media look like in the new data world? Yes? Oh, it's the very next couple of slides. It's a platform that I maintain and actively develop, but it was handed to me recently, uh, a year ago by um, 
somebody else, and I'll, I'll explain the link and, and all of that. But thank you for the question. Um, the way we look at media in this modern data world, where we're inundated with news sources, it's, it's a challenging place. We are in a media del deluge where news sources can be, can be blogs, they can be opinions, they can be tweets, they can be, they're coming from all angles. And we live in a global society where we're receiving news across boundaries, news of what happens in America actually influences us. Um, things that happen around the world, we've got a lot to process and look at at the moment. And it's pretty difficult to drive accountability, to fight fake news, because it's, it's powerful. Um, For-profit companies like Facebook are starting to become people's source for, for news and truth, whatever that may be. And that's something that doesn't sit right with me. I don't want I don't want an American for-profit company deciding what news gets pushed <laughs> on people. Maybe that's just me, and absolutely open for criticism. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but these are dangerous things where a lot of people usually, a lot of being programmers and thinking analytically, one questions a lot and one challenges a lot. But when that hosepipe of news is something that you're not too aware about, it, you can drown in it. Um, and yes, fake news. Abundant, increasingly advanced, very difficult to discern. I actually had an interesting journey with it the other day where I read that Tom Petty had died. I then read an article saying that that news was fake and Tom Petty was just in hospital, only to find out that that was the fake news. And I had now <laughs> gone on a double cycle of fake news about Tom Petty, which was quite an interesting moment, I thought. Um, and the main question now is, what does a modern media watchdog look like? How do we try and get a handle or a control on this gigantic new and advanced media world? Um, and so this is where the MMA from MMA Dexter comes from Media Monitoring Africa, which is a non-profit um, media watchdog that was set up pre-94 to monitor and analyze the, the first free elections. Um, they drive for media ethics, media quality, media freedom, and so for the last more than 20 years have been working very closely to keep an eye on and um, work with government and media. Um, and I should also give, and then this is, this is their little platform that has been developed for them and their main, their main tool that they use. Um, it's, it's Dexter, it's quite a cool little, basically trying to drive in the, the digital approach to news um, for a lot of advocacy. Um, and most importantly, and I need to mention this, I basically have taken over um, development of the code, which for several years was developed by Greg Kemper from, ground, from Open Up, formerly um, Code for South Africa. And so a lot of the platform was superbly built by Greg. And so I'm more wanting to showcase this side of what it can be used for, why it was built, put it into the, the open space and think about, and speak about my vision for where we want to take it forward. But I do want to give massively, massive shout out to Greg. Um, it's been a good journey for me to learn how to <laughs> work with somebody else's code. I'm sure a couple of people can relate to taking over a code base, um, which is quite a, qu was quite a journey for me. But it was also a really powerful opportunity to learn, learn about it. So let's get into the details. The Dexter platform. It's Python all the way down. It's a full um, Python stack system. It's built on Flask. Um, I, loved, I love Flask because coming into a space from being in engineering, I looked at Django and ran screaming because it was just too much, too fast, too soon. Um, Flask allowed me the ability to grow little bit by little bit um, and learn and add things as I needed them. And so, but this is just a really, and I, I love it now. I use, most, use it for most things, but it's a Flask app that's running on, a, on EC2. Um, all the databasing is handled with um, through SQL Alchemy. Um, and I have to give a shout out to Alembic. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I cannot recommend using it more. Um, we do any of the parallel tasks using Celery. So when I get to the pipeline of how the data flows, we'll get a sense of what is used where. But Celery is handling all our, all our task distribution. Um, we run quite a bit of natural language processing to extract out the important information from within the articles. And for that, there's a, a motley crew of things we've used. Um, nat naturally shouted has to go to NLTK, very powerful module. Text blob, which sits on top of it um, and provides some fairly quick use um, systems. And then we use, well, what's now become um, Watson language. It's still the Alchemy, IBM Alchemy API. 
and Open Calais. So the two of them are both natural language processing um, systems that have free APIs, and we use both of them just because some, some, the one is good at some things, the other is good at others, and we like to use just take both of them together. Um, for scraping, we use Beautiful Soup. Um, I am a huge fan of Scrapey as well, um, so there's no preference here. It's just this one was the one that worked, and it still works. Uh, templating, um, I got to experience the journey of Pi Hamel. Um, it's the most beautifully minimalist templating I've ever seen. It's the amazing how much web page you can create with such a few lines of code. The problem is there's almost no documentation. So that was something that handed to me. It's been a challenge. It's beautiful, but it's, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, and then for analysis, quite a, a broad suite of things from Pandas all the way to Network X. I'll get into why I'm looking at networks with news um, a little bit later. And then looking to the future, trying to bring in things like Gensum, which uses latent semantic analysis to identify topics, um, which could be quite fun. So just to give you a basic overview of the information architecture, just how does data flow through this system? What are we interested in? And everything begins with a document, with a source of text, be it from the transcription of a radio broadcast to a um, actual digital piece of media, a news article you'd read. And out of this, we're looking for two primary things, sources and entities. So a source is somebody who has been quoted on something. It's an utterance. And an entity is something that is being spoken about. And this is very, very high level. These then have their own huge levels of complexity beneath them. There are many different things. You can have entities that are people. You can have entities that are, so to begin with, your sources, you've either got named or unnamed. And then entities, you have people, which are of pretty high interest to a lot of the stuff um, MMA looks at. But they can also be organizations, places, things, um, parties, a lot of things. It's people talking about stuff. Sometimes that stuff is other people. Um, and so the general flow of information, we begin with news media from, it's now just over 100 sources. It's about 108 different news sources, some definitely more high velocity than others. You imagine that News24 media pounds <laughs> about 700 articles into the system every day. You have some smaller ones that will maybe get, like Grocott's Mail from Grahamstown, you'll get one a week. Um, but it's trying to ingest a lot of things from a lot of places. And these are scraped um, by our crawlers, which pull basically you're looking for the date of publication, you're looking for the author, and you're looking for the text, and naturally the URL, just because you can extract just who wrote it <laughs> from the URL. And then this gets fed, that raw text um, gets fed into alchemy, where you're looking for entities, taxonomies, which is hierarchical associations of things, um, utterances, and keywords. Um, very, very powerful engine. Um, and then also through Thomson Reuters' is Open Calais, where you're looking for entities, topics, which are slightly subtly different from um, taxonomies, as well as utterances and keywords. And we look for these two often fill in the blanks for each other. So they're quite a good pair to use together. And then this ends up in a in Yieldy database as a document object with the as the fundamental unit onto which a lot of things are referenced or have relationships with. And it's at this point that we start to bring in the human element because there's a lot of subtlety that machine learning cannot process right now. Um, there are nuances and um, particularly things like indirect quotations and um, looking at the sentiment. Now, we can do basic sentiment analysis, but really talking about the context in which something was said, we still need the human human discernment. And so the, the platform allows for it, it does. Yes? Sorry, why might people have something like that the Absolutely. So this is the one time where I'm going to push this off to be that's how it was built and that's how I received it. I think when this began in 2013, it was a really good choice to go with the relational database option. Um, naturally, I think going forward, there are opportunities if time presents itself to expand it. Mm. Absolutely, and I think as the system grows, there will need to be some underlying infrastructure decisions to be made. Um, this is also a unique project in that it was a journey that was never built with the exact endpoint in mind. It is as it's cat-like in agility in that it has been, it started with a purpose, new purposes were found and expanded upon and added, and the system was put, what, what it began as, it has grown into something, something, something different. Um, 
The, the powerful thing is that we've got this ability for documents to be automatically ingested, and we can then have people come and bring their own specific viewpoints and, and eyes onto things. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. So the curation is kept to very specific, often yes, no. It's, not, it's, it's, it's usually not going to be things that require too much of personal bias. It's usually, does this, has, this, has this quotation been adequately detected? Um, does the article lack a certain, it says that it's got an entity that it doesn't actually have. So it's more just making sure that the machine hasn't made mistakes rather than bringing in a lot of personal opinion. So it's, it's still very mechanical. It's just mechanical that's a little bit more advanced than machine learning that we've put on it yet. Yeah, so we try to we trying to be very cognizant that that doesn't enter the system, um, and then once we have these objects, we can push out the data to analysis. Um, and so, just a very the the data analysis is a very simple approach. You've basically the way I build a lot of the analyses. You've got this huge database of different things. Often, you're wanting to combine multiple numbers together. I just love using SQL Alchemy allows you to string together base queries and then modify them little bit by little bit to get other, s other queries that might seem perfectly normal to everyone. It was an amazing thing to me when I realized I could dynamically build queries on queries on queries, and I got very excited about it. So this would be an example of having a base level query of get keywords. It'll find all the keywords in a set of articles, and then top keywords can pull that SQL, that my SQL, that, um, SQL Alchemy query and pipe that into a counter. Makes for just a very easy and simple um, and I, was, I just felt I had to put code in if I'm going to be at a Python conference. I have to show at least that I know what Python looks like. Um, so now, what do we do with this? And sorry, one of the major things we look at is the first thing that's looked at is are all voices being counted? Do we get a good broad sweep of the country and the people within it? So, what are the most used sources? What are the types of sources? Do we look at experts only? Do we only look at politicians? Are we looking at eyewitnesses? personal opinion, these sorts of things. Are we getting a good diversity of source types? Because if you only ask academics, you're only going to get an academic answer. Um, geographically, are we accounting for the whole country? Are we neglecting provinces? Are we only representing Gauteng, KZN, and, and, Cape, and the Cape? Um, that's not... We don't want to be doing that. We want to make sure that we're giving a representation across everyone. What is the racial composition of our sources? Do we have gender parity in our sources? And so a rating can be generated per media house as to are people, <laughs> are, are we get being given a directed opinion or are we being able to get at least a broad sweep um, of opinions? The next big thing is to look at children. Um, how much of the news actually covers the activities and the association with children? Are their voices being directly heard? Are we actually quoting children on things? Um, what light are they being represented? Is it always in a negative light? Do we only talk about um, youths with, with, with problems? Do we talk about only children's child soldiers? Or do we talk about um, children that have gone on to do great things and are changing our society? And yeah, and in what capacity are they being referenced? Are we being, yeah, as I, as I just said. Um, also on investments, can we look at news articles and begin to track which countries and which cities are investing in which South African areas? How big are these investments? Where are they occurring? And how many jobs and permanent and temporary are being created? Because the media gives you a good broad data collection opportunity. And so this is one that we've recently added trying to look at what is the foreign investment that's happening in South Africa detected by the news, or what are the ones that are being spoken about, and are things happening that are not adequately being represented? Um, and now the new one that we're busy working on at the moment is to analyze journalists and media houses and ask for a given journalist quite a few, quite a few things. So, for example, what is the average number of sources per article? Is this basically an opinion piece masquerading as a real article? Are they asking from a good... Um, broad group? Do they mostly quote the same people? Um, do they only look at experts? Do they only look at politicians? Do they get a good, good, good selection? Um, the keywords and the things they most often write about, um, the things that they reference, and then looking at, we've been looking at using the HITS algorithm, um, naturally from the construction of the web, into what are your hubs and authorities in news media? You create a directed graph from authors to sources, 
and you begin to see which are the sources that connect authors or which authors connect sources and you begin to get an idea of the landscape of news and who are we seeing that are our, our real authorities in the media. At least the media we're getting is mostly these people's opinions. And so that's what we're trying to trying to start exploring a bit more there. So just to example just to show you the kind of stuff that can be pulled out, this is a very simple example from the twenty fourteen elections. You analyze who are your top sources and no surprises here. Um, but yeah, you can begin to look at who were the people whose opinions were most asked and most written about. Um, what were the places most mentioned? Now, in 2014, you can understand Pretoria, yeah, Durban, but interestingly, Cape Town's not up here. Yeah, thank you. Um, probably because it's not necessarily ANC associated. But Beckersdal and Marikana, both mining areas, suddenly became a very important source of the news over a certain period um, and were actually quite, quite influential. Um, then things that numbers that aren't great. This is now the number of percentage of documents that deal with children is less than 1%. That, I don't like that as a number, maybe that's just me, but you are dealing with a huge part of the population that's not being given any real representation across the media. And gender composition of sources. In 2014 with 8,200 8, articles, 75% of sources quoted were male. I then wanted to look at me like, okay, maybe that was just bad sampling. Um, this year, in the most recent six months, in 77,500 articles, it's still mostly men that are being referenced in the news, which is an agenda that should be looked at and should be changed. But this is the power. Numbers are a lot harder to argue with than hearsay and opinion. And so this does allow the ability to tap into a really, really important source of information that guides our society. Um, and so future directions, we're looking at developing credibility ratings for journalists and media houses. Not to say that it's fake news, but to say more if it's credible or not. So have a rating of if they have this many sources or more, it's a little bit more credible. Saying that something is fake or not is a dangerous, binary is a dangerous classification. But can we build up a scale of, represent, of, of, account, of credibility for things and give it to people who read it? We're not saying this is credible or not, just it's made these, it's ticked these boxes, so what do you think? And you can decide what your threshold is. Um, looking at the link between media and social media, do social media tweets drive articles or do articles drive tweets? And do tweets move in predictable patterns? Are you seeing natural bursting of tweets around specific topics? Can we predict patterns? If we can predict a pattern of tweets when somebody writes an article about something, there's something else going on that needs to be potentially be looked at. Yes. Mm. Sure, and so there's a huge amount of work that's being done in order to, we've, there's a lot of design that we still have to do on this to make sure that they are carefully, carefully uh, particularly transparent choices as this, we've made these assumptions about what, const what construes credibility. So absolutely, it's, it, there's a lot of nuance and subtlety that has to be done, thanks. Um, and it's, we've got to be careful about that, absolutely. Now the thing is, if it's an expert, and they're writing about a field that they know a lot about, that's a credible article. Um, and so there has to be the ability to handle unique cases. Just because I ask five people in the street about um, quantum entanglement, and, I've, and he, that person only gives their opinion, doesn't mean that mine's more credible. Theirs should be more credible because they're the expert, potentially. And so there's a lot of care that has to be taken on that, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, agenda analysis via pattern recognition and link prediction. Can we look at, can we predict things? Because if we can predict things, then there's a problem. Um, we shouldn't be able to predict things, <laughs> ideally. Um, and right now, we, the site was constructed over several years, put piece to piece, to piece by piece added together as budget was made available and as, as purpose changed. We are now going in and wanting to say, can we now look at where this, this program is, where we see it going? And let's maybe redesign the user interface and user experience and see, take stock and decide where we are now and where we want to take it. And finally, I really want to bring machine learning to assist the curation. So if we're ingesting now up to 1,000 articles a day, we can't have somebody manually go in and check 1,000 articles every single day. That's a waste of time. But can we train the system to flag um, potential concerns that people can then directly go and check? And so trying to aid the curation with some clever um, machine learning and syntactic analysis. 
So thank you very much. I really appreciate you listening at the end of the day. Um, these are just some of the partners we work with. A huge thank you has to go to Media Monitoring Africa. They are fantastic to work with. And of course, to open up for the, the wonderful work they do in the civic tech space. We partner with them a lot. And um, massive props to Greg for the hard work he did laying the foundation for, for Media Monitoring Africa. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, I have quite a few questions I'll ask you ask afterwards, but we're sure. going to take um, 10 minutes of questions now. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. So, like, uh, your sources, do you, like, have, are you, like, your hundreds, I think, your hundred sources that you actually call, I think? Your hundreds, well, your hundred sources that you actually uh, crawl, are they, like, open? Do you have, like, a list of the sources and your... You mean in terms of our media sources? Yeah. You mean so, these are just standard media channels. These are things like News24, Times Live, Business Live, um, the large media houses in the country, um, and across a couple in other, in other African countries. We've got quite a few in Kenya, like the Star. Um, so... We basically are just, these are specific, we're trying to get the whole spectrum, anybody that writes about media in South Africa, that's what we're trying to ingest. We're trying to be agnostic as to, we don't want to allow ourselves to be biased because we haven't, we've chosen a biased set, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. that kind of gets into the next question, which is also like, it's a lot of analysis, so like, how do you avoid cognitive biases in like your analysis? It's, it's another big kind of... Sure, um, and absolutely, it's, it's one of the real big problems in data science, um, and it's something that requires huge, huge um, care to deal with. Um, the main thing we try to do is have to have very clear definitions of everything we're trying to analyze. So we say that these are the assumptions, this is the data we're collecting, and these are the potential caveats, and make sure that we convey those decisions. Um, when we say, we're not going to give a number and just say, look, we found this number, you have to believe that we came to this number. The goal is to be able to rationalize and say, this is how we got to it, and this is our opinion based on these assumptions. So there it has to be a very careful design of the questions initially, but then also complete transparency as to how we made those um, conclusions. Okay. I have another question though. Are there any other questions? Another question on bias, I guess. Mm. Um, so machine learning is good at dealing with things that are the majority, but it struggles with a long tail. Um, yeah. So perhaps this is not a very concrete question, but um, can you comment on how you would deal with minority opinions or um, other minority groups, I mean, and in some cases you have minority groups that disagree with each other. Mm. In, in that case, they, they might conflict, but you can't clearly say that one's wrong and the other one's right. Sure. So the cutting point about that is not trying to say what is right and what is wrong. It's trying to absolutely tunnel down into basically dimensionali dimensionality reduce as much as you can to the core fundamentals that define the question you're trying to answer. So stay as far away from conjecture and opinion. What are concrete and as um, bias resilient uh, metrics and measures that we can find that and use those so that we exactly avoid that? And that is a huge, huge challenge, particularly because machine learning will always, it knows the world that you've taught it. Um, and it's to try and make sure that you minimize the opportunities for it to misrepresent, and also to always treat everything it says with a grain of salt. But it's a superb question. Um, and I think the goal is, once again, very careful design of what you're trying to do, and make sure that you have checks and balances in place to know when it's gone the wrong way. Um, yeah, firstly, thanks for the really great talk. Um, kind of leading on from the future work you outlined there, linking the social media to media. Um, how do you account for uh, kind of the relative influence of different sites? So you could have 200 articles all saying one thing, 
but there's yeah. one article saying another thing, but that article is much more popular and read much more. Um, how do you account for like the number of readers? Sure. Uh, it, that's a superb question. This is a very young journey we've gone on, and we've got a lot of design work to work on exactly that, trying to define what are we trying to detect and work very systematically to address exactly exactly that. And so this, though, is I really would love any opinions and thoughts on things like that. My email is up there. Um, if just This is one of those areas where we have so much design work to do on how to think about this problem that if anybody thinks about stuff and there are caveats and concerns that you have, I'd appreciate any message about them because that's, that's a superb th case that has to be considered. Um, we've just got a lot of work to do to make sure that we don't fall into those traps, but we're still at a very early phase. So I don't have the... There's nothing that I'm doing right now for it, but I will be looking to try and do something for it. Um, so can I do one more question? Um, I don't know if you know of any other uh, projects kind of doing the same thing across the world. I know there are quite a few sort of private companies that mm. offer some of the services, say, for media companies, so they would get some of this information. I don't know if there's sure. Any um, I mean, th I think there are, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of companies that I know of that do this. I mean, IBM does a huge amount of work um, in this space. They're trying to push themselves as being able to, you can tap into the news across the world. But that is usually biased because they seldom are going to give you a full average spread across the world. Um, I don't know, and I would love to know, if there are other open source um, attempts on this. This code is available. It's on GitHub um, if people want to take a look at it and work with the system. Um, but I don't, I don't know of any major, at least not in this country, um, but I'm, I must confess I haven't done a massive search of, of other um, projects on this elsewhere. Thank you. Um, just uh, back to all the different sources, D are you doing some kind of like graph analysis? Because uh, if I take the Gupta so-called botnet example, the way that they figured a lot of that out is the relationships and how they clump together. Now, mm. um, where this might be difficult is if you look at like the media in South Africa, Huffington Post is owned by Media24 as well as News24, mm. so they kind of like cross-pollinate articles and uh, also cite each other. So is that kind of an idea that you guys would work on, like graph analysis, to see the influence that it has? Absolutely. Um, that is one of the main reasons why we're looking, because graph, graph and analytics is exceptionally good at that. Um, and um, it also comes down to being making sure that our metrics are robust in anticipation of something like that happening. But absolutely, and that's where Link, I feel like, um, networks are such a wonderful way of, of interrogating this. Is it on? Okay. Um, what is your, your like user in interface or your output? Like, is this all getting published to a website? Is it? It is. I deliberately, it, sorry, I, yeah, I deliberately chose not to um, show it because I was worried about time and I managed to squeak in with 15 seconds left. Um, it is an entirely, um, it's all on the web, it's a web interface. Um, and um, it's, not a, it's not an open to the public code yet. There are parts of it that are, going, that are being used to open to the public. Um, and I think in time more of that will happen. But basically it's a CMS. Um, it really is a list of articles that you can click on which will then allow you to analyze the inf you can either you can sample down which articles you want to look at you can then look and then run analyses on it with graphs and maps and summaries um, but yeah it's it's a very very bootstrappy <laughs> um, interface so yeah it's basically a big CMS I'm happy to show if anybody's interested to see it I'll happily show you um, you want to take a look is there time we have five minutes. <laughs> oh, perfect. So I think this, and there may be one other question. Let's just see if I can exit this mode. You. Oh, the net's giving me trouble, that's why. So the internet has taken a dive. I'm just going to jump in my hotspot. Okay. 
Yeah, I want it. There we go. So this is the home. This would be the home view as somebody coming in who works within MMA, and you'll be given, this is just a little dashboard. Let's go to the main sampling page. So for example, you can use this, this form at the top is used to sample down into um, the articles that you want to look at. You pick your um, period of publication. You can tunnel down into the countries it's from, um, keyword searches. The medium is the media house. If you want to specifically look at, say, News 24 articles, um, you can look for specific people. Um, and then things like tags, dates added, um, and analyses are more an internal set of tools that um, MMA uses. But then this is now showing all the articles in the last two weeks. Um, you can get a couple of statistics, who they were written by, um, the days they were published. And you can also then go in and look at, say, we want to look at taxonomies. And you will be able to take a look at what were the fun what are the, the big topics that are being discussed over the news in this recent um, period of time. You can look at um, the key sources that have been referenced. Um, so who's trending up, who's still the same, who's trending down, um, and be able to look at, say, things like that. And you can also get a, a good geographic um, viewpoint as to where all these articles are coming. So you're starting to see already where a lot of the news is coming from versus where it's not. So, and then if people are wanting to then work with um, the actual articles themselves, this is where you can now go in and examine the articles yourself. Say, it brings up the ability to examine and tunnel into the individual article look at it, you can edit. If you see that a source has been misquoted, it's made a mistake or it's confused two people, you can go in and, and shift it and change it. Um, so yeah, and then yeah, you can edit. This is where the manual curation comes in. So that's kind of a, an idea of what the, the, the site looks like and how it's operated. Um, I think one question, there was a the lady. Oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> uh, what's, your, what's your relation with the media house? Uh, they hate you, they actually use you, what's, what's your relation with them? Um, we're, we're partners on this project. So effectively, I would, at the very bare essentials, I'm a dev for hire on this one, but we at Open Data Durban, we, will, we don't work on projects where we don't believe in the mission. So we cost very little, we charge like non-profit rates because Media Monitoring Africa is a non-profit. So they are effectively a client, I'd say, that's the style of relationship but they, I'm allowed to express my ideas and the data they want, they, we partner on the design of where we take things. So they have the mission, they have the um, activism that we want to support. I support their, their journey and they support my decisions in how to achieve that from a data perspective. So a partnership is probably the best way, and, but they receive funding to do what they do and some of that helps us keep the lights on. That's kind of the relationship. Thank you so much. Um, we have to wrap up because we got the lightning talks cool. in here at Hop. It's in here, here at Hoppers Four. Cool. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks. Bye.